Good evening, everyone. My name is Elizabeth, the Education Coordinator for Marlene's Market and Deli. Tonight's special guest it is always an honor, and we've had you twice this month, last week in person and uh, this week online. It's always an honor to work with you. We have Neil Levin, and he is a, a CCN, a DAN. LA and now Foods Health Health Group's Senior Nutrition Education Manager and has a plethora of information and expertise to share with us tonight on the topic of why do we need to take vitamins when diet isn't enough. Thank you so much, Neil, for joining us. Thanks, Elizabeth. <clears throat> Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. So this is kind of a cool thing. The, we hear a lot from uh, dietitians and, and doctors that you should be able to get everything you need from your diet. And ideally, that's true. But in real life, how does that translate to what's actually happening? And, uh, for example, there are doubters. Uh, here's Harvard University School of Public Health. A multivitamin has little or no benefit. Johns Hopkins, if you follow a healthy diet, you can get everything you need from food, Cleveland Clinic, uh, lifestyle choices. They are not fans of supplements, but they're not also looking honestly and unbiasedly at all the evidence. And when they're looking at dietary supplement studies, many of the studies are done with food records, food que frequency questionnaires, 24-hour recalls, notoriously unreliable and inaccurate, uh, as opposed to testing uh, serum levels and other more robust uh, ways of measuring. Uh, if they asked you to remember everything you ate for the last 24 hours or last week, how often do you eat these foods? Uh, and they actually compare that to food diaries, they have very little relationship to the two. People are idealistic in their memories and selective in their memories. So I've also seen some articles uh, that say people should not use dietary supplements and multivitamins in particular because they're not proven to prevent cancer and heart disease. Well, that's not why most people are taking multivitamins. That's kind of a straw man they're setting up to knock down. Uh, they're used to supplement a diet if it doesn't meet all your needs, filling gaps. Not everyone has a perfect diet. There are people on special diets that need extra help getting the nutrients they need. Uh, for a couple of examples here, vegans and vegetarians typically need supplements to get enough B12. People who live in northern climates or indoors a lot might supplement with vitamin D. I'm doing trainings in uh, the Middle East, uh, Dubai, and those that area next month. And one of the things I'm training on is vitamin D, and that area has some of the highest vitamin D deficiencies in the world, despite the abundance of sunshine, because it's hot in the summer and people are covered up for cultural and religious reasons and they're indoors a lot, they're just not getting enough vitamin D in their diet. They're also not eating you know, fish livers and things that would give them the vitamin D. And a lot of the problem is because when they're looking at the food diaries and the food recall, they're actually using measurements that are out of date in terms of how much of the vitamins and minerals are in the foods we're eating. The nutritional content is not the same as when the foods were measured originally. And we're looking at over a 50 year period, noticeable declines in multiple nutrients in foods. The food does not contain as much nutrients as it used to. They're actually calling that the dilution effect because vitamins, minerals, proteins dropping by up to a third uh, and, you know, when, when you're looking at where am I getting my vitamin B2, which you need to metabolize fats, where are you getting your vitamin C to maintain your collagen and blood vessels and your immunity? 
you're not getting as much from your food as you would think. Uh, one example I like to give, uh, about 30, <laughs> a little over 30 years ago, uh, I was working with Dr. Michael Colgan, PhD, an Australian. He was a trainer of Olympic athletes, had a compound outside of San Diego. And he, he was juicing fresh oranges and giving orange juice to them. And he wondered how much vitamin C is actually in this orange juice. So he he told us he he was he had it tested and found it was almost nothing. And he looked at the crate of oranges and it was from a fairly local farm, you know, within an hour drive or whatever. He decided to go there himself, buy a fresh crate of oranges, bring it back home and juice them and test them for vitamin C. And lo and behold, they had lots of vitamin C. The problem wasn't the oranges, it was the storage. Storing it in refrigeration for weeks or months had robbed almost all the vitamin C from it. So you can't assume in today's society where things are stored and ripened artificially and different varieties are grown than used to be grown when they built the food tables, you can't assume those are accurate anymore. The problem is a lot of food companies use the option they have, not measuring what's in their foods, but pulling the numbers from USDA food tables. So there's one generic number for all oranges and vitamin C. It doesn't matter how long it's been stored or whatever. There's no subtlety to the numbers. <coughs> Excuse me. Even in garden crops, we're seeing declines. When you see ash, that's the mineral content. But, you know, these are minerals, vitamins. Trace minerals. We're talking about selenium, chromium, those kind of things. They have declined by about three quarters in a 50-year period. In the, you know, not only United States, but in England as well, UK. Red meat has lost about half of its iron. Some products, 80% is gone. Iron has lost about 60% of its iron. And the reason why is because minerals and fats are the main differences between grazing animals and non-grazing animals, not protein. There's no difference in collagen or protein, whether... You're buying whey protein from a grass-fed or a non-grass-fed animal. But if you're looking at fractions like minerals or fats, there are significant differences. So you know, whey protein, it really doesn't matter nutritionally. But on other nutrients in milk or meat, it does make a difference. We're seeing magnesium levels fallen by 10%, and many of us are deficient in magnesium. Copper levels by 60%. We need that to make SOD, uh, an antioxidant enzyme in the body. We need that for red blood cells. Uh, there's little, literally 200 things that are copper is used as a uh, synergist for or a, an enzyme catalyst for, including things like uh, making hormones in the body. Dairy foods have lost 90% of their copper. Calcium has gone, in, uh, lost 30% in Parmesan cheese. Carrots have a quarter as much magnesium as in 1940. And when we're looking at the changes in minerals content, because minerals are really the main thing plants are taking up from the soil, but of course they can't take it up from the soil unless it's in the soil. I did lectures in... May in the Balkan area of uh, Europe, Southeast Europe. And in that zone, Eastern Europe, Southeastern Europe, uh, across Italy, everyone's low in selenium. The soil doesn't have enough selenium. If they're not eating seafood or getting some other source of selenium, they're going to be deficient. So eating local is great and you're getting fresher foods, but you're not going to get enough selenium eating local foods in that wide swath of Europe is one example. 
So we're looking at uh, various varieties of fruits, vegetables, meat, and significant reductions. Some of these 40, 50% or more, 76% loss of copper over that 50-year period. And of course, the difference is in 1940, everything was organic. And nowadays, very little is organic. Now, the concept of matched pairs, when you're looking at comparing apples to apples, literally, on farm methods, you have to use the same variety grown with different means. And these are match pairs, the same variety grown with different agricultural method. The organic ones had higher phenolics and antioxidant capacity, especially quercetin, vitamin C, vitamin E. And the difference percentage-wise, you're seeing uh, manganese, over 40% difference, magnesium, about a 30% difference, iron, over 20% difference. Significant differences in crops based on the agricultural method. And when we're looking at additional mineral content in organic versus conventional crops, we're seeing some very high numbers. Uh, Iodine is about 50% more. Chromium is 86% more. Obviously, these aren't to scale. Molybdenum over 100% more. Selenium almost four times as much. In the, or, in the organic versus conventional. So clearly there's improved nutritional quality in organic and that's one of the differences in the food supply. Antioxidants especially are better but also lower cadmium and heavy metal le levels as well as of course, lower levels of pesticides. And let me point out that uh, glyphosate, one of the most common pesticides used today is actually patented for its ability to lock up minerals and starve plants of minerals. When glyphosate is in the food supply, it works by chelating or bonding to minerals and not letting them be bioavailable. So you're actually robbing your body of minerals when you eat glyphosate or crops with glyphosate. And of course, I mentioned earlier the grazing versus grass fed. Omega-3 fatty acids is one of the huge differences between milk and meat from grazing animals and non-grazing animals. Because omega-3, uh, you know, it has to be in the soil and in the plants. And if they're not eating the right things, they're not going to get it. You know, green leafy uh, grazing uh, type plants have a lot more omega-3 than corn and soybeans. So we're looking at ALA, the precursor of omega-3. We're looking at CLA, which is a form, really a fermented form of uh, omega-6, which is very, very healthy. We're looking at the vitamin E and the beta carotene being higher in the grazing animals, uh, which you know, organic has to graze. And when we're looking at antioxidants, it even varies by season. This is your ALA, your omega-3, and the content's highest in August and March and lowest in October and May. So even seasonally, there's going to be differences. And here's your vitamin E, highest in March through May and lowest in late summer through fall. So when you get your milk or meat, there is a difference in nutrient value. It's not the same year round. And of course, nowadays we have the GMOs, the biotechnology produced gene altering crops. Now, there, there may be more today. I know the Arctic apple is coming out and some other ones, but these are the main crops that you will find that are genetically modified. Uh, you might have noticed in my credentials, I was a techn technical advisor to the non-GMO project when they were setting up their standards. So I'm very familiar with all this stuff. And, uh, you know, alfalfa, we were getting uh, alfalfa as a base for vitamin K formulas and for 
a source of chlorophyll, which we had to stop when 90 plus percent of the crop in one year went from conventional to GMO when it came out to Roundup Ready crops. Fortunately, popcorn is not GMO. Cotton, of course, the cotton seed oil is used as a food. Hawaiian papaya is GMO, but not Thai or other countries. Soybeans, a lot of it is, but you can get non-GMO and organic. Sugar beets, but not red beets, is GMO. Zucchini and yellow summer squash, that, that's a big one. Because as a vegetarian, if I'm getting fajitas or... Uh, a roasted vegetable sandwich. A lot of it is this kind of thing. But the problem is they do not release more nutritious genetically modified crops. They release ones that are have benefits to farmers. So they're not going for nutrition. For example, canola, which is rapeseed oil, which is engineered to have more vitamin A, lost a lot of its vitamin E and had its uh, fatty acids changed when they were trying to increase it. So unexpended, un unintended consequences is par for the course with genetics because genes don't do one thing and it's not one gene that does something. It's a orchestration of genes that, that have effects. So if you tweak one gene, you can't exactly predict what's going to happen. And here's genetically engineered corn, the same variety. One was changed to be Roundup ready and the other was non-altered, but this, you know, the same variety of corn grown in a field and they compared how they grew. And here's the results. There was glyphosate present in the genetically modified corn. There was tons of formaldehyde. Look at the calcium difference. 14 parts per million versus 6,130. Huge difference. Your sulfur, manganese, iron, huge differences. Your zinc, copper, all the minerals. That is to be expected because... Glyphosate works by sequestering minerals, making them unavailable. And when they're looking at organic versus conventional or non -ge or genetically modified soybeans, there's more protein, there's more zinc, and the plant is less fibrous if it's organic. Less saturated fat and more omega-6 fatty acids, including healthy ones, than conventional or genetically modified soy. And the genetically modified had high amounts of glyphosate and metabolites, which were not in the conventional or organic batches of soybeans. And just by testing nutritionally, researchers in the Food Chemistry Journal were able to determine which soybeans were genetically modified, which were conventional, and which were organic without exception. The nutritional profile was different in all three of these. So let's look at some expert opinions on why diet it may not be enough beyond what we've seen already. The percentage of the population who do not get adequate levels of nutrients based on RDAs, which are minimal amounts, they are not necessarily optimal amounts. For example, on uh, vitamin D, the optimal amount should be about 2,000 to 4,000 units, and the RDA is uh, 800. So, you know, there's a vast difference. Vitamin A, over 75% of the population is deficient. Vitamin C, almost every smoker is deficient and almost half of non-smokers. Vitamin E, almost everybody is deficient in vitamin E. And by the way, they lowered the RDA for vitamin E recently so that fewer people would be deficient by lowering the bar. And iron, women, 
who are of menstruation age, 85% of them don't get enough iron. Iron is the number one nutritional deficit of micronutrients in the world. And common problems when you have uh, deficiencies of vitamins, night blindness and vision problems, skin and gum problems, uh, smell, taste, immunity, uh, muscle twitching, uh, mood issues. Let's look at some women's issues specifically. Zinc is needed more by young women who are developing their immune systems and it helps with hormonal balance. Women need calcium, vitamins A and D for skeletal structure. That's when you're supposed to be putting on your bone mass and poor diets. A lot of young women have weird diets and poor diets and they're dieting. They're not concerned about nutrition. They're concerned about how they look. In young adulthood, you need folate and uh, other B-complex vitamins when they approach childbearing years to have healthy children. DHA is needed for cognitive development. The brain does not fully mature until about age 25. And by then, they're already starting to have children in some cases. DHA is also important for cognitive development. Most of the brain is fat, and most of that fat is DHA. So for both the mother and if they become pregnant for their child, DHA becomes even more important. There's also childbearing years hormonal balance. You need iodine for thyroid hormone, your folic acid and iron, uh, omega-3 for mood support, and of course, I mentioned the DHA. And after menopause, there's other additional issues. Estrogen production declines, and phytoestrogens are the replacement that nature gives us. Soybeans, other legumes, flax, red clover are intended to be the mitigators of menopause. In some areas of the Orient, they don't even have a word for menopause because they eat sufficient legumes that they're not having all the symptoms of menopause because of the phytoestrogens, the plant-based and and and. Let me make that this make this clear. Phytoestrogens are not estrogen. They're a thousand times weaker than the estrogen produced in a woman's body. They fit the receptors. So whether a woman has insufficient or too much estrogen, it helps to buffer and balance that. It also blocks the really nasty estrogens like pesticides and environmental chemicals. So those things can't hit the receptors. So it helps protect us as well. That's why soybeans and other legumes have so much positive studies on health benefits. And that extends especially for women of menopause age. For bone retention, they need vitamins D and K, calcium, magnesium, and other factors. Vitamin C is needed. They need to maintain healthy blood vessels. And maturing, uh, vitamin D is often needed for reduced sun exposure, protein uh, to prevent sarcopenia, the loss of muscle with age. And let's face it, a lot of older people, especially if they're single, are not focused on eating regular meals every day. They're grazing. They're not balancing the diet super well in many cases. So Abbott Nutrition has a number of nutritional needs for men. And one of them is pump up your protein. People tend to lose muscle mass as they age. And muscles are where the mitochondria, the energy factories are that are burning calories. The more you lose muscle mass, the more you lose your ability to burn calories and generate energy in the body. They also suggest getting more vitamins C and E, lowering levels of inflammation and oxidative stress to protect the coronary arteries. They recommend fish-based meals, <clears throat> the deep-colored flesh, fish like salmon, mackerel, tuna, sardines, bluefish, to get omega-3 and protein. 
ease up on refined carbs, get more whole grains so that you don't have insulin resistance, excess sugar, and problems with your glucose metabolism. Check your vitamin D levels. They help protect muscle and bone health to keep you strong. They do help the heart, not just the muscle, not just the bones. Vitamin D is needed by the immune system. It's needed by the heart. It's needed by thyroid. It's needed by the prostate. It's needed by many systems in the body. And up to four, over 40% of Americans are deficient in vitamin D, and it's even higher levels in the elderly. And of course, special diets, which I mentioned at the beginning, are of uh, concern. Vegans have the highest intakes of fiber, vitamin B1, folate, vitamin C and E, magnesium and iron, but the lowest amounts of vitamin A, B12, vitamin D, calcium, et cetera. And 52% of vegans and 7% of vegetarians were defined as vitamin B12 deficient. Only one of the people eating meat in this study was deficient in B12. So not only B12, but zinc, iron, iodine, omega-3, protein, copper, uh, you know, there, there's a number of things that are potentially deficient in a vegan diet. A paleo diet, where you're not necessarily getting your uh, B vitamins, your calcium, your vitamin D, uh, maybe if you're trying to avoid carbs, uh, there's even more issues, more concerns. Uh, which is similar to the gluten-free diet. A lot of the people on gluten-free diets are avoiding grains and carbs. They're not getting fiber. They're not getting folate. They're not getting vitamin E. They're, they're, I'm adding more things than what these uh, publications are, are mentioning. Low-carb diet. Fiber, vitamins, antioxidants, carotenoids, phytochemicals, needed for detox, blood pressure, blood sugar, weight management, mood. Men's Health says five nutrients you're not getting enough of. One is vitamin D. 30 nanogram per milliliter is the baseline in the United States. And take at least 1,400 units if results are lower. That's well above the RDA. <clears throat> magnesium. Few men reach the RDA of magnesium without supplementing. B12, and there are medications which people take when they're older, such as antacids and metformin, that block B12. Potassium, young men only get about two-thirds of the recommended amount of potassium, but they load up on sodium, and sodium contradicts potassium. They're supposed to be in balance. So produce is really your source. Uh, we are limited in pills to 99 milligrams because of one case many years ago where someone took a tablet of potassium that apparently exploded in their uh, GI tract and damaged it. And because of that, everybody today is limited to 99 milligrams in a pill without a prescription. But you can take powders or liquids in higher amounts because they won't, ex you know, there's no chance of a pill exploding in the body. But it's weird that one instance of probably one brand that was a tablet not made right caused everybody to not be able to take reasonable amounts of potassium supplements because that 4,700 milligrams, you're taking less than 100 milligrams in a pill. <clears throat> Iodine. They're not using iodized salt so much anymore. It only has maybe half as much iodine as the FDA recommends. People are not eating enough seafood. We have seen instances in the Boston area of people getting goiters from iodine deficiencies in their thyroid gland in the seafood capital of America because they're not eating as much seafood. When you're eating a whole grain, 
White flour is the starchy endosperm. You're not getting the germ or the bran. And as I said at the International Forum on Whole Grains in Beijing, China in 2011, they only perfected white flour in the late 1900s. Before then, there was always some contamination, some remnants of the German brand in white flour products. They were not completely removed until they perfected that technique uh, less than 150 years ago. So refined grains in the, for the majority of population has only been around since the late 1800s. And when you mill it, you lose your fiber, your B vitamins, your minerals, your antioxidants. Only 8% of us get three servings of whole grains daily. And both children get less than one serving. Adults get only about one serving a day. So you're losing these essential nutrients. Whole grains provide antioxidant protection. Vitamin E, for example, the tocopherols and tocotrienols. You lose your plant sterols, which have FDA-approved claims for helping to control cholesterol. And you're losing your fiber which increase stool weight and maintain transit speed. <clears throat> Whole grains are also contain prebiotic fiber that is fermented by our intestinal microflora to short chain fatty acids, which is one of the main food supplies for our intestinal cells in the large intestine and for our bifidobacteria and other anaerobic probiotics. And again, uh, looking at a population, this is in Germany, over half the people age 65 and older did not have adequate levels of vitamin D in their body. One in four had lower than recommended amounts of B12, 11% had low iron, <laughs> over 8% had low folate levels. And low folate levels does not take into account people with the MTHFR variations or mutations who might need five times as much folate as a normal person because they're making a different version of the enzyme that uh, detoxifies homocysteine. Homocysteine is a big risk factor for strokes and, and cardiovascular disease. There was just a new analysis released this week about that, by the way. And uh, if you don't have enough folic acid or folates, you can't make enough of the enzyme to compensate for making a weaker version of the enzyme because of these genetic variations, these mutations. The majority of older adults had suboptimal vitamin levels and they, became, they were very old, physically inactive and frail. Now, the most common type of vitamin taken by people is a multivitamin. <clears throat> About 40% of adults in the national survey uh, take multivitamins and about 31% of children. And of people who did take supplements of this 40%, for example, about 71% of them take a multivitamin, multimineral supplement. And they compare the intakes from supplements or what people are actually consuming from foods according to the NHANES studies, which are released. Every, you know, it takes years to actually go through the data from these because they're looking at uh, you know 16,000 plus people surveyed across the United States and a wide range of information. And they literally publish studies for years mining that information. The researchers going through it and trying to find new ways of parsing that information. 10-year trends in vitamin intake and free-living, healthy, elderly people. Vitamin intake declines with age. And they're confirming essential nutrients, your B vitamins, your vitamins A, C, and D 
are low in a large proportion of older people because they don't eat the same diet. They have limited restrictions in their in what they eat or limited variety in what they eat. And as I mentioned, you know, the older people who graze and say a widow who's not no longer making a meal for the family and res results to just going to the refrigerator or the cabinet a few times a day and grabbing something is not necessarily eating as balanced a diet as eating meals. When we're looking at uh, on the left, the percentage of elderly men who do not get sufficient levels of vitamin B1, B2, vitamin A, or vitamin C. And we're looking at it from the dark line to the light line is a 10-year period. And we're seeing an increase in the 10-year period of elderly people not getting sufficient levels of these vitamins. And we're looking at women, the same thing. It's increasing over the 10-year period. Vitamin A, the risk of deficiency is doubled on, on both of these charts. Uh, B12 is doubled in the men, almost, I'm sorry, B2, uh, doubled in the men and almost doubled in the women. Vitamin C is, is low in both of them. And people are not eating the certain number of servings of fish recommended to get their omega-3. So they have very low intakes. That's why the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 should be somewhere in the range between 1 to 1 and 1 to 3, ideally. Uh, and it should be like three parts to 1, roughly, of omega-6 to omega-3. It's now 18 to 1 is the estimate. We have way too much omega-6, not enough omega-3, which affects our ability to control inflammation in the body. So micronutrient sufficiency, intake of sufficient amount of these nutrients is not achieved by food solutions in large proportions of the population. They're not eating enough fruits, vegetables, legumes, whole grains, dairy products, and lean meats. So multivitamin mineral supplements contribute to more people meeting recommended intake of almost all essential micronutrients measured by the government surveys. In other words, taking multivitamin mineral supplements more likely guarantees you're going to get sufficient levels than diet does. And in this other study, Regularly appropriately dosed micronutrient supplementation could help older adults otherwise unable to follow dietary guidelines, meeting nutrient requirements, and preventing chronic diseases by correcting low micronutrient levels. Now, when we look at the nurse's health study, cognitive scores is higher when the nurses had taken supplements of vitamin E and C for over 10 years and there was a dose response to the duration. The, tr the P is below 0 0.05, which means it's significant. And longer duration meant lower levels of problems with cognitive ability, higher scores on cognitive tests for the people who took supplements longer. And when you're taking age and gender-specific multivitamin mineral supplements, uh, for example, you're taking a, a men's multi, you're taking a postmenopausal women's multi, you know, those kind of things, a children's multi, they help healthy populations when diet's not enough because they rarely lead to overdoses. They help to meet but not exceed the recommendations to fit the nutrient needs of the population. 51% of Americans consume multivitamin mineral supplements with at least nine micronutrients. Large portions of this population did not get usual intakes of food, of nutrients from food. They did not get enough of vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin E, calcium, or magnesium in their usual diet. 
only 0% of the population had sufficient levels of potassium, only 8% enough choline. Choline, which is related to the B vitamins and is a major uh, methyl donor in the body. Uh, you get it from egg yolks, for example, and from lecithin. Uh, choline is just named as an essential nutrient. There is now an RDA and a daily value of it in the last year. And the recommended daily allowance is now 550 milligrams a day. So it's something with, you need a fairly high amount. Only 8% get sufficient, and it's especially needed by pregnant women. Only a third of the population gets sufficient vitamin K levels, even when combining food and multivitamins. And really, there's no risk of getting overdose of nutrients from a multivitamin. The highest amount they found was zinc, and it was only 3.5% above the RDA or the upper level. The upper level in the United States is 40 milligrams, and it's based on 100 milligrams could result in blocking copper in the body. So there's a huge safety margin built in, but uh, the most they got was about 3.5% above the 40 milligrams, well within the safety margin. No real risk to the population. But compared to food alone, multivitamin, multi-mineral use at any frequency, whether you take it daily or a few times a month or every day, for 15 out of 17 nutrients, there was a lower prevalence of inadequate levels of intake. There was increased above the upper limit for seven nutrients, but again, only a 4% above the upper level. And these have huge safety margins. Like the upper limit limit for vitamin D should be uh, 10,000 units. It's set at 4,000 to have a huge safety margin. And the people who use multivitamins the most frequently, 21 days out of 30, virtually eliminated inadequacy of these nutrients, lower odds ratio of deficiencies for all nutrient bio biomarkers except iron. Iron's the hardest one, and one reason is because uh, plant foods, the iron is not well absorbed, because things like uh, polyphenols and green tea block the absorption of iron, and things like vitamin C increase the absorption of iron. So red meat, the iron absorbs really well, but in plant foods, it doesn't. And a lot of these supplements nowadays, the multivitamins are iron-free, so they don't always supply iron. If you need iron, and many people do, you have to look for a multi with iron, especially premenopausal women, young men will still need iron. But at postmenopausal women, if they're on a vegetarian diet, probably will still need to take iron. So in US adults, multivitamin mineral supplement use decreased micronutrient inadequacies Intrakes might slightly exceed the upper level, but with no real risk, but a lower risk of nutrient deficiencies. And when we're looking at the 2015 to 2020 dietary guidelines, for population below the estimated average requirements is what this up, you know, the height means. And these are the nutrients they're measuring. Food only. 30, about a third of the population or more is deficient in calcium. If they take supplements, it's about 20%. For iron, there's a few percent deficient in uh, iron without supplements and almost nobody if they're taking iron supplements. Magnesium, you cut about in half the level of people who don't get sufficient intake of magnesium if they take a multivitamin mineral with their food. Vitamin A, you almost completely eliminate vitamin A deficiencies. Vitamin C, same thing. Vitamin D, it goes from close to 90% of the population deficient to more like 20% if they're taking a supplement. Because most supplements are low dose. They're not in the thousands of, of uh, IUs. 
And vitamin E, same thing, about 80% of the population deficient without supplements and only about 10% with supplements. So taking a multivitamin, an extremely safe way to add nutrients, eliminates most of these deficiencies. Not so much magnesium. You're not going to find a lot of magnesium in most multis because the dosing is hundreds of milligrams. And the same with calcium. Vitamin D, because the levels tend to still be at that 200, 400, 600 level. So it's harder to get adequate levels when the formula, the old formulas are still lower in how much vitamin D they're giving you. And let's look at the percent of the population between the estimated average requirement for women looking at vitamins and minerals. If they take a multivitamin, they can almost completely eliminate their deficiencies in copper, in selenium, in zinc, in B1, in B2, in B3, in folate, in B6, and B12. Uh, there's a, still a little bit left for zinc and a little bit left for phosphorus, and you're not really getting this phosphorus from your multivitamins. So you can see how a multivitamin almost eliminates all these peaks of people not getting enough intake where it's close to what they need. And how frequency does someone take a multi and how does that affect it? The more frequently they take it, which is kind of running down each one of these charts, uh, from zero days a month to over 21 days a month over these four, you can see there's significant benefit if they're taking 11 to 20 days or over 21 days a month in calcium, in iron, in magnesium, in vitamin A, in vitamin C, in vitamin D, and in vitamin E, taking it at least 11 days a month, and in some cases, even one to 10 days a month, really drops these numbers significantly of people who do not get adequate levels of intake of these essential nutrients. And we know that multivitamins with folic acid are highly, highly recommended for women of childbearing age. Methylfolate does not have this benefit. It is not proven to prevent neurotube birth defects. Only folic acid has that evidence. So everyone today is jumping on the bandwagon. They need methylfolate. Only methylfolate will work. It is not recommended by authorities for preventing birth defects because there is not yet evidence that it will do that. Now, the World Health Organization and the Center for Disease Control and Prevention do recommend daily iron supplementation for most people, unless you're getting adequate iron or, again, postmenopausal women and older men with meat-eating diets probably don't need it. But pregnant women and women who are going to get pregnant should get at least 150 micrograms per day of supplemental iron iodine. That's a good, actually a good amount for everybody. And in the sister study, Healthy Sisters of Breast Cancer Patients, they looked at the association of multivitamin use with telomere length. Telomere length is like the, if you're looking at a shoelace and the aglet, the hard part at the end of the lace that holds it together, there's something like that on our genes. And methylation is the process to maintain them, by the way, uh, taking things like choline. 65% of the women use multivitamins at least once a month. 74% of those users took them daily. The use of multivitamins had longer telomere length. Daily users, there was 5% longer, which was about 10% younger genes by taking a multivitamin. So the fragility of genes, the aging of the genes, the vulnerability of the genes to being broken down and damaged declines when you have longer telomeres. And daily users knocked about 10 years off of their uh, apparent life of their genes. And other nutrients help, including marine omega-3 fatty acids, your EPA and DHA, have a role there too. 
This is a study from about a year ago. Could taking a daily multivitamin help cognitive health with aging and possibly prevent cognitive decline? And Wake Forest University School of Medicine and Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, uh, they had a study with taking a daily supplement. And it did help with cognition in older adults and protect against aging. That was in the journal of the Alzheimer's Association. Now, when they look at health professionals and how frequently they take vitamins, how frequently do they take vitamins? Who takes the most vitamins percentage-wise? Only 1% of dietitians have never used a vitamin. These are the same people who will typically tell you you can get everything you need from your diet. But when they're putting their money where their mouth is, it's buying these supplements. It's not relying only on diet. 96% of dietitians use supplements. Huge number. Pharmacists, a larger number don't. But a large number of nurse practitioners use supplements. These are 5% don't use them. Nurses, 11% don't use them. Uh, dermatologists, 25% don't use them. Higher levels of cardiologists, and there are a lot of cardiologists recommending supplements, especially for homocysteine and for uh, uh, getting your prescription fish oils for triglyceride control, et cetera. And physicians, yeah, even most of the physicians, 51% are regular users. So there's still a high percentage of all of these health professionals who are regular or occasional users. The vast majority of medical professionals take multivitamins, even when they tend to tell you that you don't need them, that they're expensive urine. They're taking them themselves. And when we're breaking it down by gender, more women than men take supplements. When we're looking at age, the higher the age, the more likely they're going to take supplements because they're trying to prevent or control health issues and balance their diets. By income, the higher the income, the more likely they're taking supplements. By education, the higher the level, the more likely they're taking supplements. What are the categories people are taking for supplements? And 98% of the people taking supplements take multivitamins or take vitamins or minerals, including multivitamins. There are other big categories, specialty supplements, herbs and botanicals, sports nutrition, weight management, but vitamins and minerals are what almost everyone takes, even if they start taking the other stuff. And for immunity, this was a big issue during COVID issue time. And my, my foster daughter and her son just got COVID uh, this week. So it's still happening. Echinacea, garlic, elderberry, turmeric, probiotics, B-complex, zinc, vitamin D, multivitamin, and vitamin C. These are the top ingredients and, and what people actually take for immunity. After vitamin C, the next most common thing people take is multivitamin. And number three is vitamin D. Number four is zinc. And lastly, what do I take? This, these are the supplements and things I take in addition to my diet. And if you notice, I start with a daily multivitamin. I take the Adam for Men formula, and I actually design the nutritional profile on it. But I add extra levels of all these nutrients and add extra things in my smoothies to fortify the diet. But these are all supplements on the left half of this that I take. There's probably a few more nowadays. Uh, you could add lysine to the list, for example. But, you know, again, I put my money where my mouth is. I take a daily multivitamin as the base. That's where I'm getting my vitamin A. That's where I'm getting part of my vitamin D. That's where I'm getting a lot, my selenium and chromium and all that kind of stuff in the daily multivitamin. 
and I'm fortifying it with other things. And if you look at this list, you can guess that I've had some heart issues because of the number of things on here that are related to that. Sometimes when I'm discussing, uh, I, one time I was in the Netherlands uh, just sitting at dinner with our distributor there and discussing, I opened up my vitamin case and uh, they start saying, oh, what are you taking? And I start describing it. And one of the ladies there said, oh, my God, I know what's wrong with you. I'm like, yep, you are right. You can tell what's wrong with me. So uh, that's the end of my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. But you know, I think that gives you a rounded version of why the food supply might not be what we think it is why our diets might be not be sufficient uh, based on our choices and things that are beyond our ability to choose and what mitigating it by taking multivitamins especially, but vitamins in general can do to correct and prevent any insufficient intake of these micronutrients, vitamins and minerals that we need to be healthy, but which may not be in our food supply or may not be in our particular diets. So thank you. Beautiful job, Neil. Thank you so much. Yeah. There were so many spots that I was just blown away by the information, like um, especially the results from the uh, GMO corn versus the organic. Yeah. It literally made my eyes water. I was like, whoa. It's such a big difference. I've got almost 15 years of research in this. And this one I actually did as a labor of love. This was not something I did to promote a specific product or for a specific um, event. This is one, you know, I, we keep getting that question. You know, I, I eat well. Why do I need a multivitamin? And I just wanted to expose the reasons why someone could use a multivitamin, why it's safe to take a multivitamin, and why it's safer to take one than not to take one in many cases. Exactly. And 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 better to know than not know. Oh, we have a question from Dave. Will taking phytoestrogens in food or supplements help to minimize estrogen expression in men? That's the question. Yes, uh, we know that, for example, uh, eating soy protein that contains the isoflavones will prevent the conversion of 2-hydroxyestrone to 16-hydroxyestrone. And 16-hydroxyestrone is a very nasty one. And that is one reason why people who take soy protein isolate have far lower levels of cancer than people who don't. So when they're looking at the population and how much soy protein isolate they're consuming, and this is not soy foods, this is not fermented soy, Soy protein isolate, <clears throat> the rate of prostate cancer goes down by 30% in those who eat the most soy protein isolate versus the least. Breast cancer in men and women goes down by 30%. Colorectal cancer goes down by 30%. And it holds true for both pre- and postmenopausal women. Wow. They're very compelling numbers, and they have specific research on the exact mechanisms by which it does that how it how it slows and prevents the progression of prostate cancer for example and i'm only mentioning diseases because i didn't mention any specific products in this so it's not a it, this is not labeling for a product this is a scientific presentation otherwise i, I wouldn't mention diseases in relation to a supplement because that's federal law you can't but in this case there is some robust substantial research not just showing oh it somehow does this we don't know why it does this and we know mechanism by mechanism how it does it and this this research would be based off of like organic soy no isolate. no this is just non-gmo oh yeah yes yes no non, non but not organic but not organic which yes which says a lot, but you know, obviously the GMO soy would be no, no way. <laughs> I, I would not buy a non-GMO soy protein product. Exactly. 
Well, and um, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, folks, uh, we we have uh, some really great uh, supplement options um, in our store. Just to just to chime in for the uh, for the for the Marlene's, but I am I was really curious too about the um. Oh, shoot, what was it? It was a uh, the um. RDAs and how you had mentioned earlier that they had lowered it was the vitamin E, I believe. Oh, they lowered a bunch of them. B12 got lowered from six micrograms to 2.4 micrograms. <gasps> That's a significant drop. Yes. Some things went up. Vitamin K went up, but they took K2 out. So what? it's only K1. It has only K1 is an essential vitamin, not K2. Well, that doesn't make any sense because it doesn't. So Are, we had to separate them on labels because the first section of a product label is listing the products that have daily values. And the second is the nutrients or, or other ingredients that don't have daily values. What is a daily value? A lot of people don't know that. Daily value is the FDA's summary of how much, uh, uh, kind of an average of the RDAs. If you ever look at the RDA charts, it's a chart. It's this level for the, for men, women, pregnant women uh, of different ages. So, you know, women over 55 and teenagers and children and pregnant women, they all might have different RDAs. And the FDA wants a single number to put on a label. So they have taken and condensed that RDA chart that might have 8, 10, 12 numbers on it, you know, they're different, and made it a single number so that they would have something that fits on a label. So it's it's simply a condensation. So the National Institute of Health, Institute of Medicine, sets the RDAs, their Food and Nutrition Board, and the FDA, a separate agency, uses that data to come up with the daily values. So that's the disconnect between the RDAs and the daily values that are actually the numbers on product labels, foods, including supplements. Wow. That is just, that, yeah, there's a huge disconnect. And then no wonder this information isn't out there to the public because there's so mis, there's so much misinformation and gaps in between that they you know, and then folks go online and get misinformation from all these people that are um, just kind of not not following the, um, you know, they don't they don't have qualifications, and then they're they're looking at this information, yeah. and it's and it's not researched. Um, well, that but, that's true, but you also have all these professionals like dietitians and doctors, like at the beginning where I'm showing Johns Hopkins and Harvard and Cleveland yeah. Clinic are saying you don't need to take vitamins, yet they're ignoring the fact that many Americans, in some instances, most Americans are getting insufficient levels, even at the RDA, and the RDA arguably is not ideal or optimal, it's minimal. Oh. What a conundrum. Well, that's why we're thankful for folks like you, um, international educator here. We're so blessed to have twice in one month yes. um, to, to share this information with us. And um, wow. Yeah, there were so many points. I don't know if you saw my um, my facial um, expressions throughout the whole presentation. I was just like, whoa, this is Your poker wild. face? <laughs> <laughs> I need to play poker with you. Oh yes. I will I will lose completely. <laughs> My poker face. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. I mean, I, I find this stuff interesting because you know, I mean I've I've actually pieced this together partially from I have a GMO presentation that some of this came from, for example. Oh. I have I've been giving presentations on vitamin D around the world since 2011 at in London uh, at the CAM Expo and uh, you know I often giving it in the Middle East in places like Dubai, which as I mentioned has one of the highest rates of vitamin D deficiencies in the world, 
because of people covering up and not going out in the sun. That's right. Yes. And yes, the and diet. For, yes. And the diet. And, you know, that's for religious purposes. But yeah, isn't it, um, isn't it like 15 minutes in the sun can help with your vitamin D? Is, is that correct? I can't remember. Well, it varies. The, the real rule of thumb is you have to look at your shadow. If your shadow is shorter than your height, you can make vitamin D. If your shadow is longer than your height, you can't. So let's say you're six feet tall, just to use a round number. If your shadow is five feet long, you can make vitamin D. If it's seven foot long, you can't. And the reason why is the, the, the lower the sun is in the sky, the more it's filtered through thick atmosphere and the U, UVB rays get filtered out. The higher in the sky the sun is, the less filtration because you know the, the atmosphere is actually fairly thin versus coming at an extreme angle. And so you're not blocking as much of those rays. There's also issues with pigmentation because the darker the pigment in your skin, the more you block vitamin D production. That's one reason why we tan. Tanning is oxidative damage where the melanin is formed by oxidizing the amino acid tyrosine which is also used to make thyroid hormone and, and, and neurotransmitters. But that melanin gets formed as an oxidative process to protect the skin from burning and oh, to block yeah. the vitamin D production so you don't overdose. People do not overdose on vitamin D from sunlight, even if they get a sunburn, because really? the, the tanning and burning blocks it. The um, melanin. In our melanin. Yep. Yeah. I, so um, how long depends on how intense the sun is. Okay. Yeah, if I, you're in Las Vegas in the summer, <clears throat> 10 or 15 minutes on each side, lying out in the sun might be plenty. If you're in Seattle, Tacoma, <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> and it's rainy, you're not getting much sunlight penetrating the clouds. But I always tell people, the United States, maybe maybe if you're in Florida, this would not be of work. But in most of the country, say from Atlanta north, Atlanta and L.A. north, you can go outside on Christmas Day or New Year's Day, stark naked, lie out in the sun all day. You can't make any vitamin D because the sun's too low in the sky. Too much of those rays are filtered. That is fascinating. I love that so much. I, I feel I feel you might have mentioned this earlier in the year. I, I just shared with the oh no, it was last year. Um back in June of last year you had done that vitamin D presentation, which I shared in the group here and on our Facebook live for those those um yeah. tuning in on live with us and yeah. Um yeah, there's a chart so from the vitamin D council that shows it's got a map of the world and you kind of go across in horizontal segments, depending on how far north of the equator you are or south and what months of the year you can make vitamin D and how intense the sun or how long you have to be in the sun to do it. Because, you know, it's for Seattle or Chicago area uh, this far north, you know, we can only make vitamin D between late March and late September. Oh, wow. The sun is too low in the sky in between that. Yeah, that's not a big window at all. And of course, if you're talking about the end of March or the late you know, or early September, you still need the sun to be you know, maybe noon and not many clouds to make vitamin D. Whereas you go out there in June, you could you know make lots of vitamin D. Exactly. So that's why supplementation is important and from good sources too. Yep. Wonderful. Oh, Neil, I always enjoy working with you. You are such a treat and um, just know your, know your info and very personable. Um, and I'm looking forward to this next year working with you again. It's going to be great. 2024. Yep. Hope it helps you and uh, your customers and their families. That's what we do it for is, you know, trying to give information that could be helpful.
Exactly. That's what it's all about. We got to help out each other in this wild world. And you see, this is not a hard sell. Buy our vitamins. We have the best vitamins, that kind of thing. This is why people need to take generic multivitamins. I mean, obviously I'm biased because I formulate a lot of our multivitamins and I think they're formulated very well, but you know, that's up to each person, what they want to take, what form, what dose, what brand. Exactly. But you're here facilitating amazing knowledge that needs to get out there and it's appreciated. So thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Dave, Roberta, everyone who's joining us. On live and we'll see you later on YouTube. Yay. Take, take good care, everyone. Cheers.